In this video, we're going to go through the camera settings and image properties for a GPU or real-time ray trace. This video is part of a series of videos on ray tracing, so if you haven't already, you may want to go back and watch the whole series. We'll begin this video by looking at how we edit the camera itself and what settings are important in there, and then we'll move on to looking at the physically based rendering technique options. We'll finish by showing how you can save the image to your computer. So to begin with, I'll open up a completed plan and I'll take a camera view, then switch over to my physically based rendering ray trace view, which we also call the GPU ray trace or the real time ray trace rendering technique. I've already adjusted my sunlight for this plan as we did in the GPU lighting video. So now we're going to adjust some of our camera settings. To edit my camera view, I'm going to go to Edit Active View here, which can also be found under Tools, Active View, then Edit Active View. Here I can save the camera if it's not saved already, and I can give it a name. I can change over to the physically based rendering technique if we hadn't already done so. And then there are a number of options that can enhance the realism of our rendering. Color obviously is an important one. Shadows and ray casted sun shadows, which is a higher quality of shadow. Reflections and mirrors like we have to the left of this view. Bloom, which is the soft halo glow we can see around lights in this view. Some people prefer for these to be off, so feel free to uncheck that if you dislike the look. And then edge smoothing when idle, which basically just means the image will crisp up when you're not moving around in the plan or making changes to it. Then we have the options we looked at in the last video the sunlight, which as I mentioned I already adjusted, and the light set, which I have set to a pre-made gym light set. Then we have some positioning options. If you want to enter precise heights and angles, you can do so here. Finally, we have an option for backdrop. Now we have a video that goes through adding a backdrop, but I just want to point out that the backdrop is a very important part of your rendering. Not only does it provide what you're looking at through the window, but it also pulls light and therefore color from it. So your scene will look very different if you're using a fall scene with a lot of yellow and orange leaves versus a bright blue sky versus a river scene that's covered in trees like this one. Backdrops are camera specific, so feel free to use different backdrops for different areas of the house or even to simulate different times of year. If you are not using a backdrop, you can choose a color here, which will also affect the lighting of your overall rendering. I'll select OK to apply our changes. Each of these changes we've made are specific to just this one camera. Now we'll take a look at our rendering technique options. I still have it open from when we changed over to physically based rendering technique, but if you don't, again, you can find it here. I'm going to go down to technique options, which will give me the ability to make some image adjustments to my physically based renderings. At the top, we have the camera exposure. While this can improve the brightness of an image, we want to be careful to not overexpose a rendering because the lights can become too bright for the scene. And we can sometimes lose the definition of things like wainscoting or cabinets and door styles if the scene is too bright. But with that having been said, with all of these options, don't be afraid to make a change and see what happens. Feel free to play with these toggles and find the settings that work for you and for the scene. As we did in the lighting video, we'll drop our daytime backdrop intensity down to about 500 or less. Again, this is a preference, but I like to have an even exposure between my interior and exterior lighting so my backdrop doesn't get washed out. Plus, this reduces the overall effect that the backdrop is having on my rendering, so I may not get as much of the color coming in. Next, we have our color adjustments. I don't usually touch hue because it can change the overall coloring of a scene very quickly. I will sometimes increase saturation, which is going to pull forward particularly the yellows and greens within my scene. Essentially, it makes the colors pop more. Then brightness will enhance the overall ambient light of the scene. More often than not, I have this all the way up to 100. Although after pulling up the brightness, you may want to check your exposure again, as you might need to reduce it. If you ever feel like you've gone too far with your toggles and you don't remember your starting values, you can always reset to defaults here at the bottom and then start again. So once we're happy with our rendering, we can export it as a picture, 
which we can then use for our marketing or to send to the client. To export this image, we'll go to File, Export, and then Export Picture. We'll choose an image size. A typical HD image is 1920 by 1080 pixels, so I always go at least that large. The resolution, which is fine at 72, unless you plan to print the image and want a high quality print, in which case you'll want to increase this to around 300. Then when we select OK, it'll ask us where we want to save it and to give it a name. It'll then need to export it, which for a large image might take a couple of minutes. So that wraps up our camera and image properties for a GPU ray trace. Next in the series of videos, we'll discuss some general tips and tricks for creating better renderings.